birthday and then okay uh and the, I, when I called the secretary at the Proton Center, I said, how long have we been open now? And she said, seven years. I said, okay, so that, now I know how to figure that one out. <laughs> but uh, since uh, seven years, it, it's been an interesting time at the Proton Center. And uh, uh, generally, it's been a very pleasant experience for me and hopefully for my patients, too. It, it, it's just a really nice place to work. And so uh, the picture you're seeing here, I don't have a camera on my computer today, so I'm the I'm the bald guy in the middle on the on the first row there, and surrounded by my fellow beer club members and my son, who hopefully will not inherit my hairline. Um, and uh, so we're going to talk. Initially, I thought we'd talk about just a little bit about the protons, how they work, the history of our facility, uh, the theoretical advantages of protons in treating cancer, and then we'll diverge into some other topics on. Uh, insurance coverage, use of space or, you know, treatment uh, decisions and things like that. We'll just kind of see where it goes. So this is our, this is our beautiful facility. And for those uh, who are in the, go by the uh, Liberty uh, Township portion of 75, you can see it from the freeway. It's connected to the, uh, the Children's uh, Liberty uh, facility. And the reason for that is that Protons have probably the best uh, track record for clinical benefit in children. And so uh, this facility was driven by a children's hospital here because they wanted to be the number one cancer pediatric cancer hospital in the nation. And they were told they probably couldn't do that unless they had a proton center. So they came to us and said, if we build it, would you like, would you guys staff it? And we were like, yeah, you know, kids in a candy store were like, sure, we'd love to do that. We'd, we love new technology. So uh, I guess it's been a success because uh, last year they were rated the number one pediatric cancer hospital. So they got their wish. Um, and it's just, a, it's amazing what they do on their side of the building. And you, I'll show you another picture of the, of the UC side of the building and you'll note that the, the difference. Uh, so the reason that people are excited about protons is because of the physical nature of the, of the particle beam. So if, if you're looking at the at figure one, that this is a standard Bragg peak of a uh, uh, the, the tracing of the energy deposition of the proton as it enters the body at the surface. And then as it gets to an energy specified peak, it goes up about fourfold and then immediately drops down and there's no dose given beyond it. So if you're aiming for a tumor that's about 20 centimeters deep, by the time you get to 25, there's no dose. And if you compare that, to the so the proton uh, beam here is in blue to a standard IMRT photon beam. You can see that you 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 avoid all this entrance dose that's just beyond the skin, but notice that the proton dose starts right at the skin. So protons can give you a little bit more skin reaction, but there's absolutely no exit dose, so you you don't get exposed to any of this on the on the way out, and that's that's the big physical advantage of protons. So what you do when you're doing treatment planning, the, the beam, again, the peak is determined by the energy you set on the machine. And so if you have a tumor that is 15 centimeters deep and goes for five centimeters to 20, you basically select all of these energies and you eliminate the ones on either side. And there's a modulator that spoos these peaks out so you get like a almost a plateau of about five centimeters in width, then you use that to treat the patient. Then you can bring the beam in on any directions and, and spread out that, that entrance dose so that you can avoid skin reactions when possible. And if you look at why this is such an advantage in kids, there, there is a tumor type called a, a brain tumor called medulloblastoma, where you have to treat the spine. And the way we used to do it, you know, 40 years ago when I was a resident, and a starting attending, we would just bring a single beam in posteriorly and you'd get a high dose at the entrance, but the beam would continue to travel through and exit out through the anterior chest. With IMRT, you could, you could improve that slightly, but you would also scatter dose through, through the, the lungs and other, other places that were lateral to the spine. And once you get to a proton beam, it treats the spinal column and you can see that there's this rapid fall off, so you're missing the heart, you miss missing the breasts, which are very important in, in young girls. And, and all 
all of this dose is spared the potential second malignancy effect of radiotherapy, which is usually a 20 to 40 year event. So in prostate cancer, it's probably not a big deal because none, none of us are probably going to live that long to ever experience that. But in children, you're going to have a, a survival after treatment of 80 years or so. so that's, that's a big deal. And if you look at it on the axial portion, you can see here the beam coming in, treating the, the spinal cord and the vertebral body. But right behind that, if you're in the chest level, this is the trachea, the breathing tubes, and the heart. And all that is getting dosed that it really doesn't need. So all this, all this area is getting dosed that could potentially be carcinogenic down the road. So if you switch to the proton beam, you can see that you can shape it to treat the whole vertebral body because you want the bone to be treated evenly so they don't develop a scoliosis. And you get the entire spinal cord treated, but very little dose falling off into the anterior chest, avoiding the breast, avoiding the heart, avoiding a lot of the lung. So that is the, the biggest example of why uh, children's wanted that, because there's so many tissues in children that respond to very low doses of radiation therapy in a bad way in terms of bone growth, in terms of teeth eruption, a variety of other things. So there's a, there are just, a, just a, a, a ton of reasons to avoid excess radiation in children. So when they came to us, they, they designed this building where there's, there's a children's side and there's a UC side. You have four gantries. We have a research facility. And this was the, uh, the layout from the beginning. And it's, you know, the, the biggest downside to protons is that they're ungodly expensive. So this facility, probably when it was designed 15 years ago and, and built over that period, uh, probably the... The machine itself had a price range of $90 million. Uh, the children's kind of built a nice building around it. So I think the project cost was over $200 million. We'll probably double that today. So just, you know, just to get what goes into the, the bill, it's a very complicated engineering feat. And I saw this building going up and I was just amazed that I was going to use this entire complex to treat a organ in, in a man that's about the size of a walnut. So it's 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 just amazing what the uh, engineering has done to direct the beam. So this is this is if you're we're looking at the construction site 10, 15 years ago, I forget exactly when they started. This is the big pit that the whole uh, machine sits in. So this these areas will become our clinic uh, offices, but back where we treat patients, there is a story in a, a, a big basement, let's put it that way. And then um, the, the, the gantries for the, 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 the uh, actual treatment machines, this would be, this would be like the, uh, the children's pit, the adult pit, the research pit would be just underneath here. And this is a, a, a story and a half underneath where patients will be walking in to get the actual treatment. So just to get you an idea of the of the size uh, and the uh, immense project that it really is and was. And then as they built up around the pits, they left holes in the roof where all of the gantries would be lowered in with a crane here. And then the cyclotron, which is right here, which supplies the, the accelerated particles to the proton beam. And again, our clinical offices are going up easy because it's, it's the last thing they finished. Dr. Redman, if you're pointing to certain things on the on the uh, slides, we don't. I don't see any any arrows or oh, points. Okay, or anything. I'm sorry. I thought my mouse was showing up. I will. I, I just won't use a pointer. I'll uh, I'll describe it a little better. So if you see that big silver tented thing in the middle there on the truck, that's the 90 ton um, particle accelerator that's going to be dropped through the roof there. And they had an interesting uh, conversation about how to get it to Cincinnati. It came from Germany. And they were either going to bring it through Baltimore and then truck it in or bring it up the Ohio River. And they found out that they could get it to the Ohio River, about, but they couldn't get through one overpass in downtown Cincinnati. So they chose the truck route from Baltimore. And the interesting thing about that is that some states wouldn't let them drive during the day. Other states wouldn't let them drive during the night. So they had to kind of plan their schedule. So they're always within the, uh, uh, the law of the state. And this is the 
this is a crane lowering that night that's a 90 ton it's basically a, a solid piece of metal with some stuff around it uh but they're going to drop that in through the roof into the uh, facility and this is where it comes in and then what children's is very proud of is that so the cyclotron, you can see that little red dot zipping around. That represents the accelerated particles, and and then at from there, there. Uh, this is a, another picture of the cyclotron being installed. And then the way the building works is the cyclotron supplies the beam to all three rooms. So if you're if you're a proton patient, usually you're in the room for about forty minutes. Those machines will do a starting CT scan to position you in the correct position. And then they will do, a, so probably three quarters of the time is positioning the patient in the correct manner and taking films to corroborate that. And then only about the last five minutes or so in the room is when the beam is on. So you can't technically treat patients, a, a pediatric patient and an adult patient at the same time, but they coordinate it so when one, one room is lining up the patient, the other room is treating the patient. And then after hours is when we can use the, the research facility. So there's the children's gantry, the adult gantry, and then the where it says future gantry is just an open bay, assuming that um, if patient volume uh, exceeds the capacity of those two, they would drop in another uh, gantry and, and do that. Um, but again, after hours is when the research gantry really gets a lot of use, and this is used to... Uh, do physics experiments, irradiate live animals. Uh, no patients are treated on the research gantry, but it just gives us a, uh, more flexibility to do the, the research projects that are usually com combined uh, efforts between the University of Cincinnati and Children's Hospital. So again, this is looking away from the, uh, the, the uh, cyclotron. So that's that kind of uh, on the left side there. And then you see all these uh, conduit and tubing and everything. That's the beam line going down. So if you look at it from another angle, that's a beam line going down the back of the building and all those kind of grayish brownish doors, what looks like that are basically entryways into each one of the gantries. And those things that look like little um, diamonds with the orange uh, inner side of those are the magnets that bend the beam into the room when it's called upon. And this is the whole thing in, in a row. You see the edge of the cyclotron and then going all the way in the back of the, uh, down to the back side of the building. Uh, every uh, five years or so, they have a patient reunion and they dial down the cyclotron so people can go back and actually look at all this. And the radiation dose is, is not uh, dangerous. Uh, so they'll, they'll show, they'll do a little show and tell back there for the patients who want to see, see what was behind the wall that was treating them. So th this is the uh, this is the room that the uh, that the gantries are in, and you can see it's a it's about a four story room. Uh, the basement is where the gantry is going to sit on that uh, metal pad that you see uh, on the floor. The middle of the room, where you see the first railing, is actually where the patients come into the room. So when they come into the room, they only see a single floor; they don't really see what's above them or below them. And uh, and there there's a big uh, above the ceiling where basically the, the gantry, when it's installed, exceeds the, the height of the room. So it rotates kind of down under the floor and then back on top. And then if you look at the other side of the gantry, which is the business end, it, it's a cone, which is in the middle. That's the that's the cone that delivers the, the protons. Those two little flapper things on the side uh, of, the, of the cone are basically part of the CT uh, capability of the machine. And then they have, uh, that lets them do a cone beam uh, CT scan for positioning of the patient. And then the table there looks like it's on an extended lever. So it's called a six degree freedom table, which means they can, um, when they take a picture of the patient the day of treatment and they overlap it with where they should be based on the, the planning scan, they can meld those images and then the table will automatically shift in that position. So you can do... Uh, up, uh, down, side to side, uh, in and out, pitch and yaw. So you get very, very good um, patient alignment. 
and you can and you can see how that gantry is rotating up into the ceiling and down through the floor so that 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 floor that that pedestal is on is a not a false floor but it uh, it lets the gantry pass underneath it so when you're talking about protons through the years there were uh but there's been some very significant uh improvements in the the accessibility and the adaptability of the machines so the, the the original proton beam in this area was in Indiana and it was a it was a, a beam that was mounted behind a wall and the beam would only come out laterally and instead of rotating the beam around the patient they would rotate the patient around the beam uh, and it it was not very uh, functional by today's standards you couldn't get a CT scan to confirm uh, positioning so you had to put a lot of markers in but they still have beams like this and on the lower left corner you can see a what looks like a, an eyeball because that's what it is and and this beam was actually pretty successful uh, in using to treat uh, ocular melanomas and then the two middle beam are basically the the scattering foils and so the next generation to get the the beam to smear out like we talked about before they would put a, a a scattering foil in there that would cause the the take off the notches of the peaks and smooth them out but the, the reaction that did that also left uh, in some neutron contamination. So there was a lot of unnecessary radiation that would be nice if you could get rid of. And then the, the characteristics of the PBS is the pencil beam scan is what we have. And it has really all the really nice features that you want. It has a, a negligible proton dose. It has very large field sizes. Um, and it uh, has a dynamic treatment method. So if you would... Uh, look at what a pencil beam scan does. It basically treats the patient almost like a, uh, a, a 3D printer. So it, it treats patients voxel by voxel and it, you, it basically paints dose around the tumor and can shape it pretty much in any way that they the doctor deems fit. So there's a lot of flexibility with this, this type of treatment. So this is just some comparative uh, prostate plans of just the passive scattering, which is the foil and uh, the pencil beam. So you could, if you look particularly above around the seminal vesicles on the lateral projection, you can see that the, the, the high dose area, which is the dose in red, conforms much better around the seminal vesicles and treats a, a, a less bowel. If you look at it on the lateral, you can see that the soft tissues ending around the the, the uh, femoral heads is, is not quite as much, a little tighter around the, uh, the rectum, most, but most, most all proton uh, facilities will treat with a rectal balloon. So that generally is not a, a huge uh, benefit. So uh, again, to tell a clinical difference between these two treatments would be very difficult. It looks great when you map it out on a, on a CT scan, a lateral projection. But if you would ask a guy 10 years later, you know, what was the big benefit? You'd be, you'd be difficult to, to say. So this is the, this is the adult side and you can see it doesn't have quite the, uh, the splash that the children's side has, but they, they let us put our sign up anyway. Um, and if you ever got proton, this treatment, this is where, or you'd come in and be greeted by our very friendly staff. Um, but if you compare protons to photons, again, in the prostate setting, so if you look on the left, that is an IMRT plan. And you can see that it is very conformal around the prostate, which is outlined in that, that red. Um, and then you can see that the, 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 the red fog around it is the high dose zone. So you're treating the prostate and the periprostatic tissues pretty well. And if you compare that to the, the proton side, which is the other, which is, has that lateral beam coming through on each side, the high dose zone really isn't that different. And it's that high dose zone that gives you most of your side effects. And so when we patients ask, are there less side effects with protons versus photons? The answer is not really, because the sexual side effects are because of the, the, the nerves that drape around the prostate, and those are in both the high dose zones. The urinary side effects are because of the urethral dose, which is the middle of the prostate. And the rectal dose is slightly better, but you know, truthfully patients, very rarely complain about that. They more complain about the rectal balloon we put in for every treatment, truthfully. But the big advantage you could see is that blue haze around the entire pelvis. 
we've eliminated all that entrance and exit dose, and we've just confined it to just right around the lateral areas. Uh, and we go in through the hips because the hips tolerate this low dose very well, and you get a lot less bladder and uh, rectal dose. And so that's when you when you're looking at this picture. This is the whole argument why people think we should be treating prostate cancer with protons. But if you then say, well, what's the clinical advantage of eliminating this radiation fog around the prostate? The answer is, in a seven-year-old man, probably not much. And this is the argument that you'll get from an insurance company when you ask to be treated with protons. They'll say, well, what's the benefit? And that's a benefit that we have, uh, we've theorized is there, but we've never proven. And this is another way of looking at it. So this is called a, a dose volume histogram. And if you look at the red line, you, then that's the line that's representing the prostate. You can see the coverage is very good. It goes out, this, this plan was written to 8,000 uh, centigrade. And you can see both the, um, both the, the IMRT plan, which is the, uh, the box, and the, the triangle, which is the, the proton beam, they're very similar. They treat the high dose zone very well. They drop off very quickly. But if you look at the yellow lines, which represent bladder dose, and the green lines, which represent the rectum, you can see, particularly as you get farther away from the, the, the high dose zone, which is on your right, and you go towards the left, the, the IMRT plan delivers a lot more dose in the 2,000 to 3,000 range and so there's there's a benefit of less radiation to those tissues. And the, the real question is, is, is that of any clinical significance? And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention my old friend, the uh, prostate implant. I, I've done about a thousand of these in my career. It's very conformal. It's just kind of fallen out of favor. But it gives you also, also gives you the same thing that you're looking for. It's just very tight doses around the prostate. And it's a lot cheaper than the other two things we just mentioned. So if you look at, in the literature, they tried to look at people who used to do a lot of uh, proton therapy versus IMRT, academic centers that were technically very good, and they would look at what is your uh, biochemical uh, re uh, control rate. And again, for the, the low risk, intermediate, and high risk, if you look at, at the top to the, pro the Mendenhall, which is the proton, and the SPRAT, which is the IMRT, the, the, the control rates are fairly similar. And if you look at the GI and uh, grade three toxicities, they're also very similar. Any difference there could be easily attributed to patient selection. So without direct randomiz randomized uh, studies from multi-centers all combining patients, it's very difficult to say one is better than the other. And this is something that's becoming more of an issue and this was a editorial that was just published in JAMA Oncology two weeks ago. And I was getting ready for this talk. I said, oh, this, this is kind of pretty pertinent to what we're going to be uh, talking about. And they said that um, in 2008, so right about the time they're thinking about opening our center and building one, they argued that there were superior dosimetric properties of protons compared to photons, IMRT, and that randomized studies were unethical. Uh, and so therefore we should just do it, except the increased cost. So if, again, if you're looking at cost differences between IMRT and protons, you're looking at about a threefold increase in cost. So if you're in the range of $35,000, $40,000 total cost for an IMRT treatment, uh, you know, if you pay cash for a, a proton treatment, you're looking at maybe $120,000, $130,000. Obviously, that's that's a lot of money to anybody, but particularly insurance companies don't like to pay it. So uh, as IMRT has gotten better, as we've gotten more used to uh, our proton machine, uh, the data wasn't really generated like it should, but everyone thought the protons were a great idea. And again, a lot of, around a lot of pediatric centers. So now there's, right now, as of 2023, there's 42 proton centers in the U.S., and uh, insurance companies are going to look at us like uh, a costly alternative. So again, just this slide just says that, um, again, people argued that physics said it should be better, but the uh, 
the studies weren't done comparing them head to head. So therefore we don't quite really know in what situations protons are beneficial and worth the extra cost. Um, again, the, the areas that seem to be proven to the insurance companies, in other words, I can go to insurance companies and say, I want to do, I, I want to do protons in this situation. Nasopharyngeal carcinoma, some head neck cancers, a lot of brain tumors. But in prostate, it's it's totally all over the place. Sometimes they'll let me do it, sometimes they won't. Depends on whether you're a Medicare patient or whether you're uh, private pay. It depends on whether you've got a Advantage plan or a supplement plan on your Medicare. And, and, then, and I tell my patients when they come to see me, I said, I would go broke if I had to bet on what I thought an insurance company would do. Because there'll be people that I don't really think need it. They'll say it's okay. There'll be other people who really think would really benefit from it. And I can't get them approved. So it's... it's it's very discouraging to physicians and patients when you, and it's a long drawn out process that is, they, they make it intentionally not very easy and they make it intentionally frustrating if I had to guess. So if, uh, now what they said, the other part of this editorial kind of blends into something else in the talk is that now we have newer technologies and radiation oncologists can always find a more expensive toy. We were really good at that. And so now we're putting uh, linear accelerators with inside of uh, uh, a, a magnetic resonance uh, machines, so MRI machines and li uh, linear accelerators combined. That really drives up the cost because you get better pictures. Uh, there's what they call adaptive radiotherapy platforms where you give a plan and then you do a PET. And if something's responding, you, you dial down the dose. And that's very expensive. But the third thing that they mention is devices that reduce dose adjacent to adjacent organs. And that's code name for SpaceOR. And so this is a technology that is, has been tested, but is really not proven as far as most people are concerned to be a real benefit. Uh, some people think it is. So this is my little caveat about SpaceOR. I do not use it uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, it, it, was, it was approved because a, there was a company study that showed that there were less grade two rectal toxicities in people that used space or versus those that didn't. But their treatment planning wasn't what I would consider up to snuff. It solved a problem that I never saw. And I know from 45 years of doing this, that anytime you stick needles in a place that usually doesn't really need to be stuck, you have complications. And so they they used what they call an invalidated dosimetric endpoint. And even though it didn't appear in the studies, there was a uh, secondary report of severe complications associated with space or including rectal vesicle fistulas, uh, abscesses. So things that were fairly uncommon. But again, if there's if there really wasn't a problem there to start with, why would you expose yourself to this? risk. But you can see the diagram there that the idea behind it is that you push the rectum away from the prostate and you get your high dose zone in in that spacer uh, uh, gel, and then you give the rectum no dose. The other worry I have is if I'm always worried about is that gel pushing prostate tumor away from the prostate also. So if you have any sort of prostatic uh, capsule penetration, you can't use space or, and a lot of times we, we don't know that we have to do special tests to try to detect it and they're not hundred percent accurate. So, because for all those things, I don't use it. And I, I know there are other very good doctors in town who use it and really think it's great. And again, the honest difference of opinion. So why don't we stop there and see if anybody has any questions before I get into my, get onto my next soapbox. So I wanted to talk about this. So, uh, I don't know if any of you know what this is, but this is basically the picture when you get uh, on an MRI workstation for, for trying to do MRI directed biopsies, which I think are great. But the thing that we all need to remember is that we're treating our patients based on de data generated from sex and biopsies 15 years ago. So, and particularly I, I, when I talked to my residents, I said, you know, how do you think that's going to affect things like the percent, percentage of cores positive? 
Or how do you think that's going to affect the Gleason scores? So all of this newer technology gives you probably better data, but data that you don't have outcomes for. And so uh, I I think this has led a little bit to and every every this basic. So obviously, if you find more course positive, if your Gleason seven instead of six, even though fifteen years ago you'd have been a six, all these things are kind of pushing you towards treatment where that may not be the best thing. So just uh, just one of, one of the many things in prostate cancer treatment where we're, we're trying to treat patients now based on how we work them up and how we treated them 15 years ago, because that's where our references are. That's where you get our survival curves from. And so you always have to keep that. It's a moving target all the time. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about PSMA PET because it's it's just amazing technology, but it, it it's a lot like the the biopsy. We're getting a lot of data now that is a lot more exact, but we have no idea what it means. So if you look at, it used to really kind of drive me crazy because when I would see patients in second opinion, they'd, they'd have a Gleason 7, their PSA would be 6, and they would come to me and I would they'd be, be talking about treatment and I'd tell them that there was a chance that the disease has already metastasized. We just didn't know about it. And we may not know about it for 15 years. And they're saying, no, no, doc, that's not me. I've had a bone scan and my bone scan is negative. And I, you know, and I would just tell them, always said, you know, you're really not even supposed to do a bone scan unless your PSA is at least 20. So, you know, so that, that we're, we're doing all these tests that have no limit of detection to find anything clinically relevant. And so you get a lot of negative scans that were probably falsely, falsely reassuring to patients, which may be a benefit. Um, but now we have PSMA and whole body MR, which are much more sensitive to distant disease. And so, again, in the comparative study that got the PSMA PET approved, and it was approved like one or two years ago, so they could be done anywhere. Uh, any place that has a PET scan, you just have to buy the, the special PSMA injection before that you use beforehand said it was 27% more accurate in detecting metastatic disease, less radiation exposure, more cost effective. Those things are all already true, but what we don't really know is, and this is the second line, it said a trial of intermediate high-risk patients led to a change in planned treatment, 23 out of 108 patients. And then the question is, are those patients better off for that change in treatment? We don't know. And so it's, it's led to a lot of uh, soul searching and trying to figure out what to do with this new information. So if you look at the NCCN guidelines, they classify PSMA PET as a first-line staging tool, and it's it's rapidly becoming that. But the EAU, which is the European uh, uh, Urology Group, it, they're a little more cautious, and they 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 say that there's no data to decide whether changing treatment due to PSMA results is really beneficially affecting patient outcomes. We don't know. Hopefully, it, it's helping us be more precise. And they had this consensus conference that they held uh, less than a year ago, the APCCC. And they it was basically getting a bunch of urologists, radiation oncologists, medical oncologists, and pathologists, everybody did prostate cancer and say, okay, who thinks this is a good idea? So there wasn't a whole lot of data involved, but it was just people trying to think it through. And so they said, yeah, we think we ought to do the PSMA PET scan for staging. And they said, even for patients with, particularly for patients with high risk, but when you get down to the, the Gleason 3 plus 4, 4 plus 3, about half would and half wouldn't. And when you got to the favorable intermediate, they said, no, don't look at it because the chances of, of a false positive, so in other words, making you think your disease is worse off than it is, is it goes up astronomically, and they wouldn't do it. So I thought that was interesting. Uh, the thing that, that you have to remember is PSMA is, is more specific, but it's not perfect. So you can get PSMA uptake in neurogenic disease. And the big one is Paget's disease. So Paget's disease is a, is a bone lesion. It's a benign bone lesion that used to befuddle us with bone scans. And I always tell patient, uh, my, my residents, that the patient I followed the longest, probably for over 30 years, was a prostate cancer guy that came to me with metastatic disease. And so I said, how do you know that? He goes, my bone scan's positive. And we looked at it and I said, it's kind of funny that it's only positive in just this one area. I said, let's let's get an MRI. And so we got the MRI and the and the radiologist said, you know, Kevin, that that might be Paget's disease. You know, you don't really know. And so I finally cajoled our 
our interventional radiologist to stick a needle in. And of course it was Paget's disease. And to just give you an idea how long ago I saw this patient, he had a Gleason score of four. You don't see fours anymore. They don't read those. But so I, I turned to him, I said, well, you know, instead of radiating your back, we could probably radiate your prostate. You'll be fine. And then I saw him through a couple more wives, uh, saw him through retirement and he ended up, uh, move. I, I would see him when he'd come back from Arizona where he would, uh, re retire in the winter too. And that, you know, he was ready to get his back radiated when, you know, you had really have to watch out for things that aren't what they appear. And so you can, a variety of benign things that happen very often and other cancers can also show up with PSMA. And so the way that if you, if you do a PSMA scan and you don't see a correlate either on MRI or CT, you have to ask yourself, is this real or am I being faked out? And you have to really use some judgment there. So typically if we wouldn't see it on a, the CT correlate, correlate of the PSMA PET, we would get a MRI. Typically, you're worried about bone lesions uh, and to see if that looks like it. And if there's if there's no evidence on of the MRI being confirming what you think is on the PET, there's there's a lot of discussion about whether you should just treat as if you didn't see that. So currently, we have no evidence that accurate staging improves clinical outcomes in advanced prostate cancer. We're still wondering. And again, there's still no evidence of the best management for prostate cancer diagnosed metastatic by PET that doesn't have that CT correlate. That's the real conundrum. And for patients who are have thought to be M0 but have one to three PSMA bone lesions, we kind of would say, okay, that's kind of the, the people that got in. I don't know if you guys know the stampede trial, but it was the idea of treating prostate cancer, even though there was some evidence of disease outside the prostate. And, and that's probably, and this was this study was done before PSMA was PET was available. And that's probably and they showed that just treating the prostate, even though there might be a couple bone lesions out there, still was a good idea to do. So there's a lot of confounding variables here that we have to deal with. So the other thing that we don't really know what to do with, there's you're gonna be hearing the, a lot of that from me today because there's a lot of questions out there that we don't know is whether you treat pelvic lymph nodes uh, in high-risk prostate cancer. And it's a question we've been asking for 40 years. It was a question in my uh, board exam, and we had the right answer then. And then five years later, we had a different right answer. But we've never been able to really prove that treating pelvic lymph nodes in someone who has a reasonably high risk of lymph nodes, and there's something called the Parton table that gives you a risk factors for you know the chances of the, your pelvic nodes being involved, and it used to be, you would say, oh, if it's over 50%, maybe we should think about, you know, treating the pelvic nodes. And the trouble with pel treating pelvic nodes is you, you bump up toxicity, and it's primarily a GI toxicity of diarrhea, irritable bowel, uh, potentially small bowel obstruction. And so you'd really like to prove that you're making people live longer by doing it. And so these are just a series of trials that have been done over the ages. The NRG, the RTG one was done in 1994, that gets a good done in Europe about the same time. And there was a lot of data to show that we improved uh, and they would always use PSAs as a kind of what they call a, a, a uh, intermittent uh, endpoint. In other words, something that was a surrogate for survival, but we could make PSAs better, but we never could really get what we really wanted, which make patients live longer. And Murthy, who's a uh, doctor in India, did did the same thing in, in their patient population. So it's a very intriguing thing. Is this really something that that we should be doing? So when we, we do treat them, we know exactly how to do it. The, 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 the map is out there. You treat the presacral lymph nodes, which is right in front of the uh, um, of the spine and the sacrum. You treat the uh, common iliac nodes, which are nodes in the pelvis. And, and this is one area where if you were going to use protons, it actually looks like it would be a good benefit. So here on the left, you see a, a the PBS is the proton beam. Uh, and you can see that it's treating the presacral nodes, which is that area along the spine. It's treating the prostate. Uh, but if you compare it to the IMRT plan, you can see that there's that intermediate to low dose that's totally, vo that's totally being uh, treating the rectum on the one side and and you can see on the axials, which is the uh, the ones that show the hips there, that the, the treatment's much more conformal. So if it is a good thing to do, I think protons would be a great way to do it. But, you know, we still haven't proven that it's good a good thing to do. We're still trying to figure that one out. 
The other one, and I, I was very interested, so you'll get a rebuttal from your lady next uh, month about the use of Decipher uh, in helping to guide treatment decisions. And, and I have to say that there are no clinically randomized trials saying it's a good thing to do, at least on the radiation end. Uh, NCCN say they can be used in selective patients uh, along with other established biomarkers. But again, we don't know if it's making us treat patients we should should be treating or, tre or not treating patients we should. And so the, the jury is still out. Um, so if you had this consensus panel over in, in Europe, they are asked how many people would use Decipher one of the other ones out there to get you, get you kind of a, a, a genomic risk. And most people said they wouldn't use it because they didn't know what to do with it. And so, but you can see it was not a, you know, 67% wouldn't do it, 54, 58, you know, based on whatever risk factor, again, over half the people said they wouldn't use it, but some people were. So who's right? We don't know. So the randomized trial that we're looking is that is one that's through the uh, NRG uh, uh, cooperative group, which is the group that does a lot of the radiation studies. And they're trying to, to do a phase three trial looking at dose uh, de-intensification for people who have a lower risk and increasing intensification for those that have a higher risk. And the way they do that is they take the standard risk categories from the NCCN, which is the low risk, which is, you know, your Gleason 6s, your PSA is less than 10, your favorable intermediates, unfavorable intermediates, and the very high, and they, they give them a score of one through three. And then they get the genomic classifier, uh, which is less than 0.45 is low risk, intermediate is 0.45 to 0.6, and high risk is greater than 0.6. They add those up, and now you've got this one through five system, which I guess is better than a one through three system, but who knows? Uh, and if you're zero, if you add these up, and if you're in the low risk, you may not need treatment at all. If you're in the intermediate risk, maybe you can get by with just radiation and not be exposed to the toxicities of uh, uh, of androgen deprivation therapy. And if you're at high risk, maybe we should do something more than just radiation and androgen deprivation. Maybe we should add a, a second uh, peripheral uh, testosterone blocker. And the, so they're, they're trying to figure out if they can pick the people who don't need treatment and back away from them, the people that might need a little bit and will do just fine. But, you know, you'd like to pick, you know, I always tell my my residents, I said, you know, if you have a room with 10 guys in it and they all have prostate cancer, you'd sure like to pick out the, the eight to nine guys that don't need anything and tell them to go home. And then the one guy that's left standing, you say, now you, we need to get really serious with you and really hit them hard. But that's that's kind of where we are. We don't know if this tier system is going to work, but it's an attempt to personalize the treatment more than just based on your Gleason score and your, uh, your uh, PSA. So I always put this one when I want to have a break in the uh, talk. So these are for my friends up at the the James. I'm a I'm an Ohio State brat. Uh, my dad was a professor there. My mother was treated there for cancer. I went to undergraduate there. But this this when I when I was doing that my VA clinic, I these guys would come down and I would tell them they probably didn't need any treatment, and they would say, well, you know, I passed three signs that said there's no routine prostate cancer. And I said, well. <laughs> Maybe there isn't, but maybe there is. But the other thing I think is really funny is like, I know we could all take off our shirts, us guys over the age of 60, and this is what we would look like. So we're at, so the shirt's hiding this chiseled form. So I said, they didn't really pick a good uh, representative of our, of, uh, of our prostate uh, population. But I think what the thing that really bothers me about the sign is that there is a, a, a huge subset of patients that don't need to be treated. And this sign kind of pushes against that and whether they meant to or not. But I, this is like, yeah, there are some things that are pretty routine and there are some things that you don't have to worry about. And, you know, I, I hate for patients to have a very non-serious prostate cancer and die of anxiety, but you see you see that all the time, people that get paralyzed by uh, not being able to make a decision. So anyway, that's my, that's another soapbox I'll jump off of. So the last thing I want to talk about is, is when I talk to this group, uh, back in 2016, this had just come out. And this was the, the Portex study, which was really trying to uh, rattle our cages in terms of what we thought we knew about prostate cancer. And this is the British study that randomized a huge amount of guys, 500 guys per arm as a three-arm study to see 
what we were really doing with prostate cancer. What were what what were we really accomplishing? And then just recently they came out with 15 year data. And I thought I might go over these with you just to kind of show you kind of where we're thinking. So it was called the PROTECT trial. I was given names that kind of have a nice ring to them. And they basically, this was a PSA screened population in England. And they, the patients who consented to go on the study were randomized, a three-way randomization to either active monitoring. So you just watch the, uh, watch the PSA, prostatectomy or radiation. And the outcome of the study was there was no change in overall survival after 10 years. And so this really made some people upset because it really challenged what they thought they knew about the prostate cancer. This is just the design of it. You can see there were 500 patients per arm. Most people agreed to go into their, assign they got the assigned treatment, but some didn't. But the way you analyze these studies is you analyze them, it's called an intent to treat study. And a majority of people got what they were supposed to. So, the, but the thing was interesting that the people who were, were undergoing active surveillance were, were allowed to jump into a, a radiation or, or a surgical treatment regimen that was approved by the protocol any time if they were worried. And generally it was a PSA driven decision. And so you can see that through the years that patients who are active monitoring, something triggered them to go to seek treatment. We don't know what is the right answer when you should do that, whether the people that were jumping to treatment were being scared into treatment or whether the people that weren't going into treatment were, were losing out on something, we just didn't know. But that's an interesting uh, observation of the study. And if you look at now that 15 years, not as many patients are jumping over. So there's a cohort that are not are sticking to their guns that are not getting active treatment. But we now, we, the 15 year follow-up basically reinforced everything we saw 10 years. So if you look at prostate specific survival at the 10 years, there's absolutely no difference depending on whether you got treated or not. Freedom from disease progression looked like that the the blue the I'm looking on the left side now. The the kind of olive colored line is is disease progression in the observation arm, and that was primarily a PSA progression. But that so people who thought this they said, oh, you're just not you didn't you didn't follow these patients long enough. Eventually, that 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 difference in disease progression will change in survival. Well, it didn't. So if you look at prostate specific survival. 15 to 17 years later on this group, they're exactly the same. If you look at metastasis-free survival, there is a slight difference in the people who are actively treated versus those that weren't. But if you look at where they were supposedly spreading to, it was in their pelvic lymph nodes and it really wasn't bothering them. They could still get treatment if they wanted to. But again, prostate cancer survival is totally unchanged. And so if you look at their primary and secondary endpoints, the total number of deaths from prostate cancer, remember there are over 500 men in each one of these groups, it range from 12 to 17%, about 12 to 17 events. So percentage wise, that's one to 2% at most. So most guys are living without their prostate cancer or bothering them. Uh, if, you, if you looked at uh, some of the secondary, secondary outcomes, uh, Death from any cause, it was anywhere from 115 to 124. Again, not a big difference there. Metastatic disease was twice in the active monitoring group. But that metastatic disease, the, the thing that raised it from like the 26 to 27 to the 51, was basically lymph node involvement. And then if you were active monitoring, you had a higher chance of being getting androgen deprivation therapy, whether you should or not is a different story. And clinical progression would, was, again, the being pushed by PSAs going up, but not if not nothing clinical that the patient could detect. So again, if you look at the differences in prostate cancer survival between the 10 and 15 years, the longer follow-up did not show any difference. Uh, you had about a one in a hundred chance of die of dying of your prostate cancer in 10 years at uh, and regardless of treatment, and you had about a two percent chance at 15 years. And so again, um, if you tried to pick out, well, maybe there was a subgroup that really should be treated versus, you know, so they, they looked at age, there wasn't any difference. They looked at the Gleason grade group, surprisingly not different. Uh, they looked at length of biopsy cords. They looked at the uh, maximum length of tumor in one biopsy. They looked at PSA on 
entry of the trial, they looked at clinical stage. I mean, all these things, you know, you definitely got worse as your clinical stage got worse. You, you know, and you looked at some of these risks, the, the Cambria risk score, the D'Amico risk score, you were all, all of them predicted who would do worse, but there was no prognostic in others. There was no treatment decision that can be made at that time to say, well, if you're in this D'Amico high risk category, you ought to have this therapy or you ought to have that therapy. Everybody did the same. They just did a little worse than the people that were low and intermediate. So after 15 years of follow-up, the prostate cancer's mortality was low. So the choice of treatment involves trade-offs, benefits and harms with the treatments of localized therapy. And the, I always tell my patients, the only therapy that I can offer that's known to be curative has side effects. The only one that doesn't have side effects is watching it. So you have to make the choice. So again, although the patient who had active monitoring had disease progression as they defined it, the overall survival was exactly the same 15 years. So they, you know, and the, uh, interesting, they had a cause of death committee because, you know, you, how do you know what somebody dies of? They tried to ferret that out. So patients were considered to have, on the second bullet point, were considered to have uh, progression if they had evidence of metastasis, uh, progression of the palpable tumor on a rectal exam. If they were started on long-term androgen therapy uh, or had local complications such as renal obstruction or fistula. And I th again, I think progression, if you define it, more, more guys would, be, would have been, if your PSA is slowly going up at that time, there was a strong push by physicians and patients to be started on androgen deprivation, which has a lot of side effects in and of itself. So the purpose of the active monitoring was to minimize over-treatment so that you could give radical treatment when it was necessary. So that what the study proves is that you can have treatment now versus later. It makes no difference. Do we know when uh, when to, to switch somebody from active monitoring to treatment? We, we don't know. There, there, there's all sorts of uh, people who say, oh, you, they draw lines in the sand. Oh, if your PSA gets above this, we've got to do something. Or if, you know, and I always tell my patients, it's, it's really a function of how nervous you are about it, what your age is, and how fast the PSA is going up. And how worried are you about side effects? And the, the three side effects that we always talk about are sexual side effects, urinary side effects, and, and GI side effects, rectal side effects. And again, androgen deprivation was offered to everyone where the PSA was 20 or higher. Again, I follow a lot of patients who PSA is 20 or higher in their 80s, and we don't start androgen deprivation therapy. And again, it also drove them to imaging. So you're going to obviously see more bone lesions if you're PSA is higher rather than lower. Whether you should or not is a different story. So this is, I thought, was an interesting way of looking at it, that you would need to treat 27 men with a prostatectomy rather than active monitoring to avoid one, one of them having metastatic disease. That difference would probably be a pelvic node. And you would have to treat nine men with either radiation or prostatectomy to avoid having clinical progression as they defined it, even though clinical progression had nothing to do with survival. So you're treating a lot of men for a very questionable benefit. And again, if they tried to look at the patients who had metastasis, and again, that's these groups, you know, the gray groups, you had a, there were more people who had metastatic disease um, who were group three or in the high Cambria or D'Amico or Cambridge. But the mean, mean age didn't seem to be any difference. And the interesting, the PSA, uh, on going into the study didn't really change who developed metastatic disease in all three groups. And the other thing that I'll hear a lot complaints about the study is I'll say, Kevin, this, this isn't realistic because those guys all had that real early prostate cancer that we wouldn't treat anyway, they, even though they, they typically do. But if you look at their group that got treated with prostatectomy, uh, probably, uh, and it's on that bottom line there, it says once they looked at the prostate, uh, gland under a microscope, you know, doing sections through it after the surgery, that they upgraded patients to at least group two. So not, again, that usually means Gleason three plus four. Over half the patients had that, so it's it's applicable to a lot of a lot of men that that I currently see. So when when pay, when guys come in with Gleason three plus four, and they're de deciding what to do for treatment, I say, well, you know, there's not a good evidence that treatment's gonna make any difference. This is, and I show, I hand this article out all the time. 
if I think the patient's sophisticated enough to read it. So again, if you're looking at what the breakdown of the, what, what, where the active monitoring fell short from the prostatectomy or the radiotherapy, it was not really in bony lesions. It was primarily in regional lymph node metastasis. And again, you look at prostate specific death all in the two to 3% range of 15 years. So again, if you, then they compared them against each other. If you prostate versus active monitoring, uh, 12 out of uh, 7,700 per deaths per years versus 17, not significant. Uh, if you compared radiation therapy versus active monitoring, you had uh, no, uh, maybe a trend towards active monitoring being a little worse at 12 years, but after you got past 12 years, they equaled out. So there probably never was really a difference. And so you, whenever you make the argument for active monitoring, you say, well, what are you, you know, what are you gaining by it? And what you're gaining is these, these outcomes of urinary function and effects on quality of life. So these are all quality of life urination scores, the various uh, tested uh, patient reporting uh, scores. And in every one of these, the, the person who did worse was the person who had surgery. And we all know that if you have surgery, you got to be able to put up with having a pad probably one out of five times. Uh, it's, you know, because some guys, it doesn't bother a lot. Some guys hate it. And so you have to say, okay, are you willing to accept that risk of that complication? And then you look at sexual side effects. And I tell patients that come for radiation therapy because they think I'm going to keep their, their erections going. I said, no, that's actually not true. The only thing that really protects your erections is not to do anything but watch your prostate cancer. And age takes its toll regardless. So all of these, you know, as you follow men through, uh, you know, through the study, the erections get worse, but uh, the, the, the best category is always the active monitoring. And then if you look at bowel function score, this is where radiation kind of shows up as the bad guy. So there is a rectal bother score that is slightly worse. If you look at B up there on the top, that rectal bother score, the, the yellow line is radiation and it's slightly worse. You know, some guys say, oh, it's not a big deal. But I mean, if you're scoring, you know, what, you know, differences in therapy and you're looking specifically at side effects, the, 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 the rectal toxicity is the thing where radiation kind of falls short. And then if you look at kind of overall quality of life uh, scores, interestingly enough, the guy, I, I, if you look at people who have anxiety, it's the guys who are watching it because they're, you know, they're constantly being told by doctors, you sure you're doing the right thing? But there's really no difference. It's just interesting that the, that the people who are watching it have slightly higher anxiety, even though it's not clinically significant, but most, most of them is totally equal. So, um, so if you look at, this is how they scored, you know, urinary function, sexual function, bowel function, and, and quality. These are all tested uh, uh, metrics for determining quality of life. And, that, those, and the, those are the ones you have to use to really compare these things to. And then if you compare the side effects uh, to uh, in other studies that, that randomized, you know, if you look at... Uh, um, Erection is not firm enough for intercourse. Active monitoring always has the best. Uh, you know, 51 of the 51 of the time, it's, it's, it's not half, it's not working half the time of active monitoring. But if you've had radical radiation or radiation therapy, it's higher than that. If you look at uh, incontinence of any defined by any use of absorbent pad, you know, uh, radical prostatectomy is up there in the one out of one out of at least the one out of four range. And, and so all these things are kind of what we kind of already knew, but this study just kind of confirmed it. And if you, you say, is that applicable to America? Well, if you look at some of the surveillance trials that are not randomized, but they followed large groups of patients who were who had prostate cancer and decided to have active surveillance, uh, the, the number is pretty comparable to what you saw in the study. Um, so that should kind of admit there's, there's, there's a lot of doctors I know that they won't follow prostate cancer. They want to follow it. They'll just send them to me because they're uncomfortable doing it. 
and I always tell patients, you know, you have to find a doctor who's, you know, who's willing to to work with you, you know, because I have patients come in all the time and their PSA goes up. And I, the first thing I'll tell them to do is let's repeat another one in three months and see if it goes down. And it almost always does. So, pro, you know, PSAs are just, are not, they're like your blood pressure. They vary with time. And so you have to look for a trend line. So th these are, I, I jokingly call these Redmond rules, but this is what I tell the, I tell my residents and there's, there's no one who is more uncomfortable than watching prostate cancer than a new doctor who's just graduated from medical school. They are so tuned into doing something that to have them sit on their hands is it's almost painful to watch. So if you're over the age of 70 and you have a group one or group two uh, uh, pathology, you have a really good reason not to observe them. So in a, the, the favorable intermediate risk, good reason, they should always be consider observation. If you're going to radiate them, I, you, I, I don't think you should do it any more than over five and a half weeks. Four weeks might be okay. As the data matures for cyber knife, maybe you just need five treatments. If you're going to treat the unfavorable or the high risk, you should consider using ADT. And that's where a lot of the major side effects come in. I think you, you only, the imaging has to be done with a purpose. I typically don't treat pelvic nodes. I always tell patients, be realistic with life expectancy estimates. There are very good social security estimators. There's a more so Kettering where you can just plug it in and they'll tell you, you know, within a, a air bar of a couple of years is probably how long you're going to go. So if some people have un, unrealistic expectations of how long you're going to live. So when I'm looking at somebody who's in their 78 and I say, you have to, we can do nothing in 15 years. It'll be the same. They're like, well, what about beyond that? I'm like, dude, you're going to be 92. Uh, so you have to kind of, and I tell patients, you know, you have to say, would you rather have your erections now? Or would you rather have treatment, lose your erections and live a couple, you know, instead of dying 92, die at 94. And you have to kind of look at it, you know, different ways to get guys to kind of think about it a bit more and not, and think about what they really want. And the last one is, I think you have to accrue patients to clinical trials. You have to assume that you're not as smart as you think you are as a doctor and put and kind of put people on trials and see if your biases are correct. And sometimes they're correct and sometimes they're not. And I've been doing this long enough to know that if my biases are incorrect, I need to change them. And so I do. So that's the end of my talk. Uh, be glad to have any questions or any rebuttals from those who think I sold something too much one way or the other. And uh and I really apologize for not being able to see you guys in person. I, there's nothing I like better to stand in front of a live audience and look, see looks on faces and maybe get a laugh or two.